Shall we rise up to pray? You want to commit yourself to the Lord today that the Bible study will find you at the point of your need. That the Lord himself, through his word, by his spirit, will speak to your heart. That the Lord will show you your relationship with him. The life as it stands in the presence of the Lord. And that the Lord will grant you the heart, the love, the will, the willingness to do as he wants us to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Heavenly Father, we bless your name. We always do because we realize that only alive by your grace and the privilege we have to come to listen to you, to your word, week after week and month after month and year after year, not everybody on us has this opportunity. Lord, we thank you and we bless your name because you have kept us alive so that you can speak to us once again and we can do what you want us to do in life. Lord, we pray your word will reach every heart today, both here in all the places we're hearing the word in Jesus' name. And we pray that this word will make an unforgettable impact in every life even tonight. Lead us to the kind of decision you want us to make a decision that will be rewardable in eternity. Thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. You can sit down. As we come to the Bible study tonight, we'll come back to the first epistle of Paul, the apostle to the Thessalonians. Already when chapter 2, I just want to remind you that in chapter 1, Paul, the apostle, spoke about much concerning the children of God in Thessalonica. He said in verse 3, Remembering without ceasing your work of faith and your labor of love and your patience of hope. He spoke about them as the people that had the word of God. When they had the word of God, they opened their hearts to the word. We're told in verse 5, For our gospel came not unto you in watch only, but also in power. It came to them in assurance, in conviction. And they received the word of God as the word of God. I want to remind you that it made a change in them. A real transformation took place. They were renewed by the power of the Holy Ghost that came with the word unto them. That's why it says in chapter 1 verse 6, And ye became followers. Or following idols before following society before following their own minds before but now they became followers of the lord and of the apostles then it says having received the word in much affliction with joy of the holy ghost there was affliction there was persecution there was, was pain there were difficulties on their way but all that pain and persecution, the pressure of the world, and the suffering society did not cancel the joy of the Lord and the joy that comes with salvation. The psalmist said, grant me or give me or restore to me the joy of thy salvation. When you turn your life over to the Lord, you repent of your sins and you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, what joy you have. In fact, the Bible says that joy in heaven for everyone that turns away from sin, every one that repents, not only joy in heaven, there's joy in your heart as well. And in the case of these Thessalonians, it says, they receive the word of God or joy, the joy of the Holy Ghost. And I want to ask you if you have been born again, if you are saved, 
Where is that joy? Do you still have the joy of the Holy Ghost in the midst of persecution, in the midst of suffering, in the midst of free misrepresentation and misunderstanding? Do you still keep the joy of salvation? And then a transformation that took place, it says in verse 7, so that ye became, ye were examples to all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia. Not only that, they had been born again, they were living a life that showed that they were believing Believers, their lives are turned around. Their character totally changed, and their conduct was very, very different from what it was before. In fact, it says they became so winners too, telling other people how they knew the Lord and how they also should know the Lord. In verse 8, for from you sounded out the watch of the Lord, and not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but in also in every place your faith, your faith for salvation and your faith for real sanctity of life and your faith for turning towards the lord and your faith that changes your life makes you a new creature now living a life that's above sin above reproach above evil that faith became known in every place your faith toward toward god uh, had spread abroad so that we need not speak anything for they themselves show of us what manner of entering we urge unto you and how ye turn to god from idols to serve the living and the true God. Now in chapter 2, it's still speaking, speaking about them. It's not speaking about the preachers themselves. We'll speak about the converts and we'll speak about the soul winners. We'll speak about the members of the church, their faith, their salvation, their holiness, their righteousness, their purity, their conduct of life. And now we we'll speak about the preachers, about the ministers. And so it begins in chapter 2, verse 1, For yourselves, brethren, know our entrance in unto you, that it was not in vain. And I spoke about the very fact that they were not looking for the praise of men, recognition of men. They were not looking for rewards from men. All they were looking for was to please the Lord. Look at verse 5. For it says, Neither at any time used we flattering words, as you know, nor a cloak of covetousness, God is witness, nor of men sought we glory. These people were totally sold out to the Lord, and the focus of their life, the impact of their life, and the direction of their lives was only to please the Lord. They were not trying to attract attention to themselves. They were not trying to win the favor of men. They were not trying to do anything to please anybody or to displease anybody for that matter, but just to be serving the Lord. It says, when we might have been body someone to you as the apostles of Christ, how did they behave? How did they live? How did they conduct their lives? Look at verse 7. But we were gentle among you. Paul the apostle said, we are not callous or cruel or wicked or boisterous or oppressive. We were gentle among you. Even as a nurse, a nursing mother cherishes her children. So, being affectionately desirous of you, we are willing to have imparted unto you not the gospel of Christ or the gospel of God only, but also our own souls because you are dear unto us. Paul the apostle counted the believers dear precious, priceless. And because of that, every opportunity of ministering, he gave the word and he gave his very soul with it. He wanted to impart everything is God because the people were precious unto him. Now we come to verse 9, which we're concentrating on today. For ye remember. Now you'll find Paul the apostle always telling the people to remember, to remember. And he wants you to remember today's man of life. He wants you to remember the way he preached the gospel. He wants you to remember his sacrifice and then his suffering and the way he gave himself completely without reservation. He says, remember. Why are you to remember? You are to remember because he wants you to do the same thing. Look at Acts of the Apostles, chapter 20, verse 31. Acts chapter 20. Verse 31, therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. It says you must remember 
the passion we had, the priority we put into the preaching of the gospel. And now he's telling the Thessalonian believers, he said, you remember what we did to remember. And back to first Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 9. For you remember, brethren, our labor and travail. He said, you must remember, you must recollect this. Our labor and travail, physical labor, spiritual labor. Secular labor, spiritual and sacred labor. You remember, brethren, a labor and travail for laboring night and day. Think about that. In the night, they preach. In the day, they watch. When the people went to their work, they should. They went to their work, to their work because Paul, the apostle, was a tent maker. And he labored in that during the day. And then in the preaching for crusades and for night meetings and for revival and bringing people to the Lord and just selling himself out to do the work of God without reservation, without reserving any energy at all. He said, we did it. We labored, we toiled, we travailed night and day because we would not be chargeable unto any of you. We didn't want to court or we didn't want to uh, kind of befriend, associate with the rich people among you as if we're looking for something. We just gave everything that we've got night and day, preaching the gospel and working to support ourselves. And then he said in the latter part, of that verse 9, we preached unto you the gospel of God. Paul's commitment was exemplary, which means that it's an example for you, an example for me. The kind of commitment he had and the kind of consecration that he had and the way he sold himself out to preach the word, not only exemplary, is challenging, is challenging and asking a question, what have you done? What have I done? How far have you gone? How far have I gone? How have you preached the gospel? How have I preached the gospel? How have you labored day and night, travailing and toiling and laboring to preach the word of God? Now, the reason why Paul the Apostle did that is that he was looking in three directions. Number one, he looked at the past, he saw the cross. He looked at the present, he saw his call. He looked at the future, he saw the crown. He always kept his eyes on the past, on the present, on the future. In the past, he saw the cross. In the present, he saw the call and the commission. And then in the future, he saw the crown. He tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, a meeting from verse 14. It says, for the love of Christ constraineth us. That's the reason he labored. That's the reason he traveled. That's the reason he toiled. That's the reason he preached in the night and worked during the day. That's the reason he did everything that he did. For the glory of God, for the salvation of souls. Because the love of Christ constraineth us. Because we thus judge that if one died for all, then were all dead. You know, so what he's saying? He's saying, I should have died in my sin. But he became my substitute. I should have perished in my sin. But he bore my punishment for me. I should have been lost in hell, suffering forever. But Jesus Christ, my sin bearer. Jesus Christ, my substitute. Jesus Christ, the final sacrifice. My savior. He gave everything for me. He said, because of that, I count myself as dead. And a dead man will not walk for himself. Will not plead for himself. Will not, up, uh, will not exalt himself. He says in verse 15, and that he died for all that they which live shall not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him that on but live uh, but live unto him that died for them and rose again. It was considering some points. You have it on your outline there. Number one, he considered that God in great mercy sent his only son, the only son he had to die in his place. And he said, If the father has done that, if God has done that, then I'm dead. That means I'm dead to all the things of the world, the praise of the world, the blame of the world, the frown of the world, the favor of the world. I'm dead to all that. Number two, the Lord Jesus willingly came from, from the, the splendors, splendors of heaven so that, for, and then he came to the fields and the shame of this world for me. Then he said, which debt will I not go? And which shame will I not endure? And which reproach will not endure? Looking at what Jesus Christ has done for me. 
All I need is just to pay a little back. You cannot pay everything back, but Jesus had done quite a lot. And he came to the shame and the reproach and the fields and the dead of this world. I'll go any length for him. Number three, in order to save my soul, he suffered and bled and died. And therefore, I can suffer too. I can bleed you. I can die to you because of other people that still need to know the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ for them. And then the one who died was not just a man. It was the same one who brought the worlds into existence. Look at the riches of Christ, the glory of Christ, the honor of Christ, and the exaltation of Christ. And at such an exalted one, and such a wonderful one, and such an eternal one shall come and die for me. What else will I not do? Then number five, he died for me when I was an enemy of his. Who will do that for you? That while you were still a sinner, an enemy of righteousness, an enemy of purity, an enemy of holiness, an enemy of heaven, an enemy of God, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, he abandoned everything and he died for you. He said, if that is so, I'm looking back at the cross and because of the value of the cross and because of the greatness of what Christ has done for me on the cross of Calvary, I will willingly do anything and everything for the salvation of souls today. Number six, the sufferings he endured to pay the penalty for my sins were so great that no human mind will ever be able to understand. He said, I will never understand. You will never understand. The world will never understand. The mind of man will never be able to comprehend or understand what Christ has done. And if it's so deep, if it's so high, if it's so broad, if it's so wide, what he has done, what do you think I should do then? I should give all my life. Love so amazing and so divine demands my life, my all, and my heart as well. And because of this, he says, that's why I'm doing what I'm doing. That's why I'm laboring day and night. And that is the reason why I toil and labor and travail. That's why I preach the gospel as well. Number seven, he died in order to set me free from the slip market of sin. To be my master, my lord, and my king and to take me to heaven to live with him forever. He said, when I look back at the cross and I see the meaning of the cross, the sacrifice at the cross, and a great sin the Lord gave up at the cross, I want to give him my all. That's looking back to the cross. But I told you, he looked back to the past. He looked also at the present, at his call, at his commission. Paul, the apostle, looked at the present life and he looked through the eyes of Christ. And he says what he said. He repeated the same words of Jesus Christ to himself day by day. And I want to ask you, how many times have you repeated those words of Jesus unto yourself? You wake up in the morning, you say, I must walk the works of him that sent me while it is day, the night cometh when no man can walk. And then when in the day you see sinners going around and then you say, you remind yourself, I must walk the works of him that sent me while it is day, the night cometh when no man shall walk. When you meet your colleagues, when you meet your co-workers and when you meet your schoolmates and when you meet your friends and your neighbors, do you remember, do you remind yourself that you must walk the works of him that sent you into this world while it is day, the night cometh when no man can walk. That's the way. Paul, the apostle, spoke to himself. That's what he thought. He thought, as we must think on those unspeakably solemn words, he says, just one life, only one life. And it is so very brief. In fact, the life is so brief that Moses compared it to a sleep. And David compared it to a shadow. And Job calls it a weaver shuttle. James thinks of it as a vapor. And Peter sees it as grass that withers away. Not many lives, just one only one life and it will soon be over and it is what you do for the Lord today that will be rewarded in eternity that's why you want to say well this man that wrote this I shall pass through this world but once any good thing therefore that I can do or any kindness that I can show any human being let me do it now they may die before you meet them again. You may not meet them ever. Because of that, any good thing you can do, the preaching of the gospel, telling the laws how they ought to be saved, 
do it now. Let me not defer, delay, or neglect it, for I shall not pass this way again. He also looked at the future. He looked at the crown. At the past, he saw the cross. In the present, he saw his call. In the future, he saw the crown. And he always looked in the future, living each day in the light of eternity. Eternity, time without end. Eternity was always on his mind. He had been captured and conquered by these facts. Number one, all that pleases us is but for a moment. Think about it. What pleases you? The celebration, the joy of the world. The coming of a child to the family, the marrying of a wife, the marrying of a husband, the getting of a job, the having of a certificate, whatever it is, all that pleases us is just for a moment. And then all that troubles us, the pain, the persecution, the ridicule, the insult, the abuse, the pressure of the world, everything that troubles us is just for a moment. And then that only is important, which is eternal. That's how Paul the Apostle thought. That's the reason he went out. And that's the reason he said, you must remember, you remember, how we labored among you, we labored and travailed day and night, because we'll not be chargeable unto any man, and we preach the gospel of God unto everyone. I'm coming back to you. that John chapter 9. Open your Bible, John chapter 9. I'm reading from verse 4. As he looked at the past and the present and the future, he says, there's just one thing to do. To live like Christ. To walk like Christ. To labor like Christ. To travel like Christ. To win souls like Christ. And to be devoted to what Christ was devoted to. In John chapter 9, I'm looking at verse 4. It says, I must walk. Whatever others do, others may jest and play and waste their lives and throw their lives away. Others may be involved in things that are not essential, not important, not eternally rewardable. But in my own case, Jesus said, I must walk. The works of him that sent me while it is day, the night cometh when no man can walk. I want you to look at that word there, works in the plural. Works in the plural. I must walk the works. The works. And Paul, the apostle, understood that it's not just one isolated thing, one solitary thing. Works. Number one, to evangelize the world. To evangelize the world. Do you think about that? That you are to evangelize the world? Sometimes you are buried in the church. Sometimes you are buried in church activity and you are doing this and doing this and doing that. And it's a world that is perishing. And you must understand it's not just one single work. You are to devote yourself to, you are to work the works of him that sent you. Romans chapter 15, I'm reading from verse 20. Romans chapter 15, we're looking at verse 20. Yea, for so have I tried to preach the gospel, not where Christ was named, lest I should build upon another man's foundation. There are many people there that have never heard, they have never known. Don't just bury yourself in the church. Evangelize the world. Number two, establish the converts. Establish the converts. That's what Paul the Apostle did. I must work the works of him that sent me. Evangelism is wonderful. It's great. It's a great responsibility. After those converts, I want to the Lord. Establish them. Establish the converts. I'm looking at Acts of the Apostles chapter 14. Acts chapter 14. 14, verse 21, verse 22. And when they had preached the gospel to that city and had taught many, they returned again to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch, confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith, establishing them. You establish the converse. Number three, enlist all members in the church as soul winners. Enlist, enroll employ, engage all the members of the church as soul winners. That's how the early church did it. 
And that's how we are to do it. And if the pastors never tell the members, if the coordinators never tell the members, if the group coordinators never tell the members, they'll not try up and do it. If they think that all we're to do is just to bury ourselves in the church, church activity and church uh, responsibility, this is what to do in this committee, in that committee, without evangelism, nobody will evangelize. And the real work that ought to be done will not be done. And you just be involved in one work. One duty, one responsibility, but I must work the works of him that sent me. We're looking at Acts chapter 8 verse 4. Acts chapter 8 verse 4. Therefore, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. Those were members of the church. They enlisted them. They engaged them. They enrolled them in preaching the word as soul winners. And that's what they taught the Thessalonian believers because they taught them. They told them, you know, we're not the only one to preach the gospel. We are apostles and prophets and pastors and preachers. But but you too, as members of the church, reach out to your neighbors. And so they did. Number four, equip workers to plant and pastor churches. Equip workers. Those workers, as they're growing up, get them equipped and get them uh, so much educated that they'll be able to do the work of church planting and the work of pastoring churches in 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2, we're looking at verse 2. And the things that thou hast search of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men. Don't just think, Timothy, that you have to do the work alone. National, national overseer, state overseer, region overseer. Don't you just think, I'm going to do it alone. I'll run here, I'll run the years. You ought to run. Paul ran. But even though he ran, even though he labored day and night, night and day, because he will not be chargeable to anyone. And he preached the gospel in the regions beyond. He did it like no other man did it. And yet, he committed it to Timothy, to Titus, to Epaphroditus, and to a Titic Titus and everybody and he was telling Timothy and telling you too the things that thou hast said of me among many witnesses the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also Titus chapter 1 verse 5 for this cause left I thee in Crete that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting and ordain elders in every city as I had appointed you. You see what they were to do? They were to multiply themselves so that we have more pastors and more ministers and more preachers and more evangelists that will do the work he has given us to do. Not only that, edify the church. Edify the church. It's not just to edify the church. It's not just to educate the people in the church. We're to evangelize the world. We're to establish the converts. We're to enlist all members as soul winners. And we're to equip workers to plant churches and to pastor churches. And then we remember the church that we're also to make sure that we're defining the church, equipping the church, enlightening the church. So that the church will be what it ought to be. I'm looking at Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. I'm reading from verse 11. And he gives some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and, and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the equipping of the saints, for the defining of the saints for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. And so you find what Paul the apostle did and what the Lord is expecting that you and I will do and we're going to do it effectively in Jesus' name. Need a good, good amen. amen. We're going to divide the story to three parts. Number one, the exemplary commitment of Paul and his partners. Thank God for people like Paul. Why not for people like Paul? The gospel might not have come to you. And then you don't, allow, don't want the gospel to die at your doorstep. You want to pick up the baton and then do it like Paul the apostle and his partners did. The exemplary commitment of Paul and his partners. Number two, the expected contentment of pilgrims with purpose. Pilgrims with purpose. The people who know where they're going. They know where they're coming from. They know where they're living. And they know the purpose of being a pilgrim, being a Christian, being a child of God. The expected contentment that such people ought to have. Number three, explicit commandment on the priority of 
preaching. Explicit commandment on the priority of preaching. I'll come back to number one, the exemplary commitment of Paul and his partners. We're coming to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 9. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. We're looking at verse 9. But you remember, brethren, our labor and travail. You remember, brethren, our labor and travail for laboring day and night. Laboring day and night. It reminded the Thessalonians that they were not idle people. They were not busy bodies. They were not people that didn't have anything to do. And you know, there are many ministers like that. It's like they don't have anything to do except on Sunday morning. Out of the 168 hours of the week, they only spend about two, three hours on Sunday. And that is all they do. And they say they are full-time pastors and there's nothing else to do. Monday through to Saturday, they're not doing anything. But Paul, the apostle, said we're not like that. And we've shown you the example of commitment. How we committed ourselves. Because you must remember, brethren, our labor. And remember our travail because we're laboring night and day. I want you to look at First Corinthians chapter 4, verse 12. First Corinthians chapter 12, chapter 4, verse 12. And labor walking with our own hands. And labor walking with our own hands. Being reviled or blessed. Being persecuted with suffered. It says, this is how we did the work. And this is how we're passing it on to you to do the work. So that you too, you will labor working with your own hands. That's real secular work. Look at verse 16. Wherefore, I beseech you, be ye followers of me. He said, are you a child of God? Are you a member of the church? Are you born again? And have you been converted unto the Lord? By these epistles we're reading that God inspired Paul the apostle to write. He said, be ye followers of me too and labor. We're looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 9 verse 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. We're looking at verse 6. Oh, I only am Barnabas. Have not we power to bear, to forbear walking? He said, others are not walking, but we, we are not following the examples. Have we not the power, the liberty, the authority? Have we not the privilege also to forbear walking and to stop walking? You know, there are people that, you know, all they want to do is, uh, they don't want to do their secular work. They say God is calling them. God is calling everybody. He wants everybody to be so winner. He wants everybody to be preaching. He wants everybody to be evangelizing. And there's, there's nothing peculiar in God calling you but then you still keep on your on your secular job and paul the apostle said we're not we're not we're not lazy we're not idle we're not indolent we're walking walking with our hands or are we not, don't we have power to forbear walking and then he goes on look at verse 18 in verse 18 it says watch is my reward then Verily that when I preach the gospel, I mimic the gospel of Christ without charge, that I abuse not my power in the gospel. It says, I don't put any price on my preaching. I don't put any charge on my preaching. I just labor and I work and I support myself and then I keep on preaching, keep on walking. I pray that God will give us the grace. I say God will give us the grace. I will thank the Lord for this, our church, that we have a people that give all their time and all their lives and, you know, whatever we call them, group coordinators or coordinators or we call them even pastors, even some overseers that are still working. And some people will look down on them and say, maybe they don't have any faith that why they're still working. No, they're following the example of Paul the Apostle. And Paul the Apostle said, that's how we did it. And you can do it too like that. We'll keep on doing that in Jesus' name. You know, in some other churches, uh, they kind of, uh, they, they think they're doing well. They think they're doing good. And they say that, you know, anybody that does anything in our church, we just pay them. They pay their ushers, and they pay their musicians, and they pay their singers, and they pay the cleaners, and they pay everybody. Nobody does any volunteer work. They say, in our church here, we just lavish money upon everybody. And if you are there, you do anything in the church at all, we're going to pay you so much. But we don't do that. We just follow the scriptures. And Paul 
Paul, the apostle said, I've left an example for you that you should do as I have done because we labor night and day and traveling and toiling and laboring so that will not be chargeable to any of you. We're looking at 1 Timothy chapter 4 verse 10. 1 Timothy chapter 4. And we're looking at verse 10. For therefore, we both labor and suffer reproach. You see, Paul the Apostle here telling us that this is how he did it. He suffered and yet he labored because we trust in the living God who is the Savior of all men, especially of those that believe. These things command and teach. Tell them how we have done it. And you teach them to you how they are to do it. How they are to labor and they are to travail. The great commission cannot be fulfilled. And the world will not be evangelized if Christian ministry was done only by full-time ministers. If the work was done only by the apostles in Jerusalem, the gospel will not spread to everybody. But all those people that were scattered abroad, volunteer workers, soul winners, evangelists, members of the church. They preached the gospel everywhere they went. That's how the gospel got everywhere. And Paul the apostle with all his partners, that's how they did it here. They labored and they travailed. And then if we just now relegate everything to the full-time workers and the full-time overseers and the full-time pastors, and they say they are paid to do that. They are paid to do the work. How many are they going to reach? Are they going to reach the people in your office? Are they going to reach the people in your market? Are they going to reach the people in your community. We are to do it all. The full-time workers alone will not be able to do it. All Christians in secular employment must also be involved in sacred spiritual ministry. It is God's overall plan, of course, that everyone should earn his living by walking. The Lord had said in the sweat of our face, we shall eat bread. He had said, six days shall thou labor and do all thy work. In fact, we are told in Psalm 104, look at Psalm 104, verse 23, and see what the Lord had said, which is a common thing for everybody, a common responsibility and a common duty for everyone to take care of. Psalm 104, verse 20, verse 23, man goeth forth unto his work and to his labor until the evening. That's what you should do. That's the word of God, that you go to your labor every day, every working day. On Sunday, on the Lord's Day, you come, you worship the Lord. It says we go to our labor. In Second Th Thessalonians chapter two, chapter three, Second Thessalonians chapter three, we're reading there from verse ten. Second Thessalonians chapter three, verse ten. For even when we were with you, this we commanded you that if any would not work, neither should he eat. If any would not work, neither should he eat. We should work to take care of ourselves and our families. And then we should that we must remember that the job is not the main thing in life. That's what we're learning from the commitment of Paul the Apostle and the commitment of his partners that the work you do, the secular work, yes, is important. You have to feed yourself, feed your family, educate your children, pay your house rent. You have to do the normal work, but that's not the end of life. We're called to preach. First of all, you're a Christian. First of all, you're a soul winner. First of all, you're a preacher. And then you're working in the secular employment. And you will not allow that secular employment to take all your time. You make sure that you're still committed to the work of the Lord. Like the Lord has shown us, we're going to do it in that way in Jesus' name. We come back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 9. I come to point number 2. Point number 2 now, the expected com contentment of pilgrims with purpose. The expected contentment of pilgrims with purpose. We are pilgrims. In fact, the Bible says you can put your finger there in first Thessalonians, and then you look at first Peter chapter 2 verse 11 and see what the scripture calls us. We're strangers in this world. We're pilgrims in this world. Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims. 
are strangers and pilgrims. We're not citizens, really, in the spiritual sense of this world. We do not belong to this world. We belong to the kingdom of God. And we're passing through this life. We're passing through this world. We're strangers and pilgrims. We abstain from fleshly laws which war against the soul. Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. I'm reading from verse 13. Reminding also we are pilgrims and strangers in this world. Hebrews chapter 11. I'm reading there from verse 13. This all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were persuaded, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. Strangers and pilgrims on the earth. As we're strangers here then, what are we to do? We're to concentrate on the work that the Father has given us. The Lord has a reason for keeping us in the world after we're born again. He has a reason for keeping us in this world after we came into the kingdom to keep us as a pilgrim, to keep us as strangers in this world to get something done. And whatever of the whatever things of the world, we have the little money, some little property and all that, that should be sufficient. We have contentment so that we can concentrate on the work he has given us to do. The secret of Paul's success in ministry was a virtuous combination of godliness and contentment. Contentment, a virtuous combination of godliness and contentment. We're looking at Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. I'm reading from verse 11. Philippians chapter 4 verse 11. Not that I speak in respect of want. For I have learned in whatsoever state I am, there we to be content. In whatsoever state I am, to be content. Do you know the people that forsake the work of God because they are not content? Because they're not satisfied. Or they say, I want to go for extra education, extra certificate. I want to go for evening studies. And then they abandon the work of the Lord. And they say, I don't have time for evangelizing now, preaching the gospel now. Because I'm not, I'm not satisfied with my level. I want to be this. I want to be that. Paul, the apostle said, that's not my case. I have learned in whatsoever state I am, there we to be content. In verse 12, for I know how to obey, how to be abased, and I know how to abound. I know how to work with the little I have. Little money, I'm all right. I'm great, much money, I'm all right. Whatever I have, whatever I not have, I'm going to keep on preaching the word. And uh, you know, it's, it's like many people are changing that today. Everybody wants to be rich. Everybody wants to have the things of this world in abundance. But the Lord is saying, be content. Have contentment with what you have. And then devote your life, your time, your skill, everything you've got into the preaching of the gospel. I know how to be abased. And I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things, I am instructed to both to be full and to be hungry. Both to abound and to suffer need. To suffer want. To suffer scarcity. I can do all things. Have you noticed how many people, I, I even think most of us, probably all of us, we just cut out verse 13 and we say, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. But you know what Paul the Apostle means? He says, I know how to be abased, I can do that because Christ strengthens me. I know how to abound, I can do that because Christ strengthens me. I know how to suffer want and deal scarcity and deal famine and deal hunger because I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And when the food is available, I know how to enjoy that cheer because I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. He's telling us that contentment is very important. Godliness with contentment. First Timothy chapter 6. First Timothy chapter 6. I'm reading there from verse 6. First Timothy chapter 6, verse 6. For godliness with contentment is great gain. Godliness with contentment is great gain. I don't know how many people have left her Bible study. I don't know how many people are forsaking the fellowshipping of ourselves together because they say all we emphasize is holiness, all we emphasize is godliness, all we emphasize is uh, purity of heart, all we emphasize is they see what purity and heaven would look all we emphasize is just sanctification and because of that they say i'm not contented with that i'm not satisfied with that i want prosperity i want this i don't know how many people have left this place of worship because they're not happy they're not satisfied 
It's not enough for them that to emphasize godliness, sanctification, holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. But here Paul the apostle tells us godliness with contentment is great gain. And then contentment without godliness is a great loss. They run out of prosperity, out of success, out of riches, out of wealth. And they leave holiness behind. And they leave godliness behind. And they leave sanctification behind. And then they go to fellowship in a place where all the emphasis about money, riches, wealth, success. But the Lord is telling us, if you have contentment without godliness, you have the most men, most miserable. Because that's hell fire. It says in verse 7, For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain that we can carry nothing out. Having food and raiment, let us be there we satisfied, content, happy. In verse 9, but they that will be rich fall into temptation and is near, and into many foolish and not for laws which draw men in destruction and uh, perdition. For the love of money is what? It's the root of all evil. The love of money, that's covetousness. That's the root of all evil. Covetousness is the greedy compulsion to get more. Even if God doesn't want that person to have it, he still wants to have it, like Balaam. Covetousness is idolatry because it worships and serves that which is created rather than the creator. Covetousness denies the real purpose of our existence. Covetousness makes us forget that we're here for bigger business, not to make money. The business of soul winning, the business of preaching, the business of evangelization, the business of expanding, extending the kingdom of God, the business of establishing the work of the Lord and the presence of the Lord in every community. That's why we're here. But covetousness deems the view and makes people to forget the best use of their money. That is for spiritual purposes. Covetousness is irrational, making people to strive to get things that they don't even need. It frustrates God's plan for world evangelization by holding money and holding back men uh, who could have been used or useful in the propagation of the gospel. They want to get more. They want to do more. They want to gain more. And that makes them to waste a whole lifetime. But the Lord is telling us we need to come back and remember that we are to be satisfied with what we have. Come back to 1 Timothy chapter 6 verse, verse 9 and verse 10 again. 1 Timothy chapter 6 verse 9. But they that will be rich, that means those who say, by all means, whether God wants that or not, whether God is choosing me to be a missionary or a preacher or a pastor or not, I don't want to care about that. I want to be a millionaire. I want to have riches. I want to have wealth. They that to be rich, by all means, fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful laws which drown men in destruction. They destroy their soul. They destroy their future. They destroy their prospects. They destroy the opportunities they have to be able to have reward in heaven. And any perdition, that means they go to hell eventually for the love of money, is the root of all evil. Some will even sell their very soul to get the money. Others will sell their family. They neglect their family, abandon their family. Others will sell the church. Others will sell spiritual things and give up doctrine, give up the Christian life just to make money. And it says, for the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith. They just go from faith to falsehood. They begin to misinterpret the scripture, twist the scripture, so that it will say what, what they want the scriptures to say. I pray you will not be like that. We're looking at Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13. Reading from verse 5. Let your conversation be without covetousness. Let your manner of life be without covetousness. Let your discussion, your interaction, your relating with other believers be without covetousness. And be content with such things as ye have. For he, for he has said, I will never leave thee, I will never forsake thee. Count his presence more important than money. Count the privilege of knowing the Lord, of getting saved, of getting sanctified, 
of being baptized in the Holy Ghost and the privilege of being a soul winner and the privilege of working for God and the privilege of being involved in kingdom expansion here on earth counts that more important than making money, than prosperity on earth. Because he has said, I will never leave thee. My presence will be with thee. Then he says, I will never forsake you. My power will be with you also. In verse 6, so that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. And he's greater than money. He's greater than riches. He's greater than prosperity. He's greater than wealth. He is my helper. What shall man, what can man do unto me? That's what the Lord wants us to have at the back of our mind. So that this gospel will preach it without any hindrance in Jesus' name. And you know how the devil catches uh, many people, he catches them through this covetousness. In some countries, monkeys are trapped by putting some nuts into a bottle, or banana into a bottle, or rice in a bottle. And the hole that is the opening of that bottle will only be able to take the hand of the monkey. When there's nothing in his hand, he puts his hand inside and then to draw it out, he has to catch, you know, some banana or some nuts there. And it's very difficult to put, to, uh, to pull out the hand. And while he's trying to just grab everything he can get, and he will not let go, then the hunters will come and catch that monkey and trap the monkey. And many people are trapped like that by Satan, by the flesh, by the world, by all the things in this world. That's what the Lord is warning us. It says, flee covetousness so that you'll be able to give your life to everything that the Lord wants us to do. I pray that will be wise in Jesus' name. I come to point number three now. Point number three, explicit commandment on the priority of preaching. Explicit commandment on the priority of preaching. I'm looking at 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. I read verse 9. For ye remember, brethren, our labor and travail. That's point number one. Our labor and travail. You saw our commitment, our labor and travail. You saw how we devoted ourselves so that we'll not be chargeable unto anyone. That's how we committed ourselves. Point number one, exemplary commitment of Paul and his partners. Now point number two, for laboring night and day because we would not be chargeable unto any of you. We had a kind of contentment, expected contentment of pilgrims with purpose. Now point number three, it says, we preached unto you the gospel of God. We preached unto you the gospel of God. Point number three now, we're looking at the explicit commandment on the priority of preaching. The priority of preaching. And you will see here what the Lord is telling us throughout the life of Paul the Apostle. He said he got a vision, a heavenly vision. A spiritual vision, a life-consuming vision, a kind of vision that gave him passion and fire and gave him zeal and focus. We're looking at Acts of the Apostles, chapter 26. Acts, chapter 26. And I'm reading there from verse 19. It says in verse 19, whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision. I got the vision from heaven. It brought zeal in my life, fire in my life. Flame, the flame of Pentecost kept on burning and the passion, the zeal to preach the word of God. And that heavenly vision, I was not disobedient unto it, but I showed force unto them of Damascus at Jerusalem and throughout all the coasts of Judea and then to the Gentiles that they should repent and turn to God and do works meet for repentance. He said, that's what I did and that's what he wants everybody every one of us to do. We're looking at Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1, we're looking at verse 1. How did he see himself? And how did he comport his life, conduct his life? Romans chapter 1 verse 1. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God. He said, I'm a tent maker, but I'm not separated to a tent making. I still walk with my hand, but I'm not separated unto that secular work. The number one thing in my life, the priority of my life is preaching the gospel. 
Yes, I do other things to maintain my life, to support myself, to take care of myself. And you might be doing other things to take care of your family, to educate your children, and to be able to pay your house rent. But you are not separated unto just that. You are separated unto the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at verse 14. I am debtor both to the Greeks. I'm not a debtor to my company, to a corporation, to tent making. I'm not a debtor to society. I'm not a debtor to all the things that the people of the world want me to do. There's one debt I have to pay. And it says, I'm debtor to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. So, as much as in me is, I am ready to preach. Ready to preach. Are you ready? You will do it in Jesus' name. So that every spare time you have, you go to work in the morning, by the time you're coming back, you're preaching the gospel. That should be your life. You must say, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are Rome also. In verse 16, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. The true Christian lives with a passion. He concentrates on the priority of life demanded by his Lord. He considered no sacrifice too great to make for his master and for the salvation of lost sinners. If you are a real believer and you are worth your salt and you are worth the name by which you are called, a saint, a soul winner, a child of God, you must know that there is no sacrifice that is too much to pay for lost sinners to come into the kingdom of God. Your money, your time, your very life, they are place at the Lord's disposal to be spent as the Lord pleases. He, you, as a true child of God, as Christ born slave, will give up for Christ whatever others consider necessities of life or whatever they consider as indispensable rights in life. Such a believer saved by the grace of God and focusing on heaven will have an unwavering allegiance to the Lord and he is ever willing and prepared to follow the path of self-renunciation which the master himself has trod. And that's uh, how Paul the Apostle lived his life. Paul was driven by passion for souls. He cried out, Woe is me if I preach not the gospel. First Corinthians chapter 9. First Corinthians chapter 9. I'm reading there from verse 16. First Corinthians chapter 9 verse 16. For though I preach the gospel... I have nothing to glory of. For necessity is laid on me. Yea, woe is me if I preach not the gospel. I pray that will be your passion. That will be the priority of your life. Look at verse 19. For though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself servant unto all, that I might gain the more. And then it says in verse 20, and unto the Jews I became as a Jew, and uh, that I might gain the Jews to, the, to them that are under the law, as under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law, to them that are, that are without law, as without law, being not without law to God, but under the law to Christ, that I might gain them that are without law, to the weak became I as weak, that I might gain the weak. I am made all things to all men that I might by all means do what? Save some. That's what he did and that's what we are going to do. Paul the apostle gave his life and he gave his very soul unto this work. The world about us is perishing. A hundred thousand souls are dying every day and they are passing to a Christless eternity. Every Christian ought to sit quietly for an hour and think about hell. Think about the foreverness, eternality of that. And think about the darkness of hell and the torments of hell. And every Christian should think about relatives and friends and neighbors and young people and old people alike who will soon be there. If you will not rise up and talk to those people, how they ought to come to know the Lord. Every Christian should think about it long enough so that you will never be able to live the routine life, complacent Christian life again to know it cure for cancer, a cure for an incredible disease, and then to keep it yourself selfishly, you'll be accused of modern. Likewise, you know the cure for souls. 
not and not to share that will be the you'll be a murderer of souls you will be held accountable for what you did with the great commission i pray that god will give us the heart to make the great commission the preaching of the gospel a priority in jesus name can i have a good amen there I want you to look at this subtitle, Explicit Command on the Priority of Preaching. The Priority of Preaching. The Priority of Preaching. What's a priority? I'm sure that all of, most of us will know the word priority. Priority means it's something of greater importance than every other thing. When we say something is of priority, it means it's of greater importance than any other thing in life. It's, it means that it's the first thing that has a claim on your life, a claim on your resources, a claim on your time, and it's the highest claim that we're talking about. I'm going to look at this and, and look at what preaching is and look at what priority preaching has. Number one, preaching is above popularity. There are many people that spend all their lives and all they want to be is to be popular. Popular in the world, popular in the church, and popular in their company, and popular in their particular profession. It may be that they have a particular profession. They want to be popular in that. They want their names to enter into the book of who is who. And that's what they're laboring on and working after. And because of that, they're not giving their time, their resources, their life into the preaching of the gospel. But the preaching is the prayer Priority number one, the priority of preaching above popularity. Mark chapter one. Mark chapter one. I'm reading from verse 36. And Simon and they that were with him followed after him. And when they had found him, they said unto him, All men seek for thee. Popularity. All men seek for thee. And there are people that will do almost anything to get that done. They want their names and their pictures in the newspapers. They want their names and their pictures in some special magazines. And because of that, they abandon preaching. But preaching has the priority. Look at the next verse in verse 38. But he said unto them, let us go into the next towns that I may preach there also. For therefore came I forth. He said, popularity, get away with that. Put that under your feet. Trample on that under your feet. Because preaching has priority over popularity. Verse 39, and he preached in the synagogue throughout all Galilee and cast out devils. Number two, preaching above society expectation. You see, there are some people, all they're looking for is, how does society value me? How does society evaluate me? Are they praising me because I do the regular thing, the traditional thing, the expected thing? But you need to understand that preaching has priority over the society expectation. Luke chapter 9, Luke chapter 9, verse 59. In Luke chapter 9, verse 59, and he said unto another, follow me. But he said, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. That's the expectation of society. That's expectation of my family. Family expectation. Society expectation. They expect me to give a decent burial to my dad, to my father. And now that he is dead, I must do something. Or maybe he's not dead yet and I want him to die so that after he's dead, I will give a befitting burial. Then after that, I will do anything. But the Lord is saying, preaching as priority over those expectations of society. Look at verse 60. Jesus said, said unto him, let the dead bury their dead, but go thou and preach the kingdom of God. The preaching has priority over all those expectations of society. Number three, preaching has priority above denominational profit, denominational position, denominational promotion. You know, there are people, they are buried in the denomination. I'm not talking about just people out there. Even over here, this deeper life church is becoming a denomination. When you, have, uh, when you have branches all over in many places and then you have organized meetings and you have organized conferences and organized programs and then you know that that's our church, that's a, that's a denomination. And there are people that the profit that they get, personal profit, I'm not talking about money, even the names by which they are called, the position they have and the promotion they have and they bury themselves in the denomination and they're not going to do any other thing and they don't understand that so winning. 
evangelism, reaching out, becoming a missionary, has priority over the denominational position of profit or promotion. I'm looking at uh, Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1. We're reading from verse 13. Galatians chapter 1, verse 13. For ye have heard of my conversation, my manner of life in time past, in the Jews' religion. How that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it. And then it says in verse 14, and profited in the Jewish religion. That was his denomination at that time. He profited in the Jewish religion above many, my equals in my own nation, being more exceedingly zealous of the traditions of my fathers. But when it pleased God... Who separated me from a mother's womb and called me by his grace to reveal his son in me that I might preach, preaching, that I might preach all the denominational profit and position and promotion. I abandoned that because preaching is above every other thing. Do you make that the priority of your life? Or is it that I want you, you know, I'm a Zonalian, I want to be a coordinator, I want to be a, co- a group coordinator, I want to be this, I want to be that position? Is it just the joy of being called by that name, by that title? How about all the people around you? You know, there's sometimes uh, somebody is under discipline for maybe something, just organizational discipline, that is, uh, not because the person has done anything that is sinful according to the scripture, but maybe it goes against the organization of the church, administration of the church. I say, hey, come on here. That's not the way we ought to do things. Therefore, you are disciplined, but you know you're a child of God. Or even if you did something wrong scripturally, you are disciplined. After a deal to you, you pray. And you set you over the Lord. And you know now that if the rapture takes place, you are going to go in the rapture. Although the church has not lifted the discipline. And then you go to work, you come back, you don't evangelize. Why not? Because I'm under discipline. What kind of discipline? In, even in that stage, you know you are a child of God. If you saw somebody dying, you're not help them. I'm under discipline. If you saw somebody not knowing the way of the Lord, the word of the Lord, and your sins have been forgiven, and you have the assurance within you, the Lord has forgiven you, and you're just waiting for the church to lift the discipline, wouldn't you preach the gospel and understand it's not your position in the church, promotion in the church, profit in the church that matters. The preaching of the gospel has priority. Look at verse 16. To reveal the son in, his son in me, that I might preach him among the heathen. Immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood. Number four, the priority of preaching above church activity. The priority of preaching above church activity. You know, there are many things we do in the church. Very good things, wonderful things, profitable things, useful things, commendable things that we do in the church. And yet, all those things, there is no way to compare them with the preaching of the gospel. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. I'm looking at verse 17. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 17. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Paul the apostle said, yes, I know. What about baptism is important? There's something more important. Yes, I know. What about baptism was commanded? There was something more also commanded, but greater than what about baptism. And Paul the apostle said, even that important church activity, I'm not going to allow that to take the place of preaching. For Christ has not sent me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Think about the things you do. Many of the things we do are not even as important as water baptism. There are many things we do, very important, don't misunderstand me. Very beneficial to the church, don't misunderstand me. And we appreciate you, don't misunderstand me. Don't go out of here and say that the pastor said, all I'm doing is not appreciated, it's not important, it's not good. I didn't say that. Water baptism was good, commanded, important, essential. And yet Paul the apostle said... There's something more important. The preaching of the gospel. Think about the things we do. You can think about that. What you do in particular in the church. You know that those things are not commanded. They're not commanded, but they're good. They're good. The many things that we do, and you check out from Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you'll not find those things. They're good things. They're good things, but they're not commanded. In the Acts of the Apostles, you can check up from chapter 1 to chapter 28. Those are the things that we do. 
in the administration of the church, in the organization of the church, in the putting the church together, in making the church to run smoothly. Wonderful things. But check out from Acts of the Apostles, from the first chapter to the end, they are not commanded. But the things that he commands, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. We allow those things that are not commanded to take the place of the things that are commanded. The priority of preaching above church activity. For Christ has not commanded me to, to baptize. But then he said, he sent me to preach the gospel. Number five, the priority of preaching above successful business. Business. The priority of preaching above successful business. All the businesses we have, all the money we make, all the riches we have, after you are dead, everything will be forgotten. All the money. Your money will not be buried with you. Your certificates will not be buried with you. And all the name you have and all the company you raise up, that will not be buried with you. There is something more important that makes you rich. In the kingdom of God, that makes you rich in eternity, that makes you rewarded in eternity. That's the priority. Look at Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12. I'm reading there from verse 15. And he said unto them, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesses. And he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain man, a rich man, brought forth plentifully. That's good, but that's not the most important. That's not the priority of life. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do? Because I have no room to where to bestow my fruits. And he said, This will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater. And there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease and eat and drink and be merry. But God said unto him, What? Are you not a fool if all your life is just getting money, making money, earning money, saving money, investing money, stock exchange, and all, all, that's all you do? That's all you do? That's all you do? You want to leave this behind? You want to have stack it up in the bank and stack it up everywhere? That's good, that's good, but that's not, that's, you allow the good thing to take the best away from your hand. And it's foolish for us to allow something good to obliterate, cancel, nullify, destroy the better and the best. The best is to preach. Is to win souls. Is to expand the kingdom of God. Is to reach out and go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. If you allow money making, business expansion to take that away from your hand, it will be of all men the most foolish in eternity. Verse 20, but God said unto him, thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then who shall those things be which thou hast provided? So you see that layeth up treasure for himself and it's not reached toward God. What makes you reach towards God? The work you do in the kingdom. That will be rewarded. That will be remembered for all eternity. That's what makes you reach in heaven. Number six, the priority of preaching above riches and wealth. Above riches and wealth. We're looking at 1 Timothy chapter 6 and I'm reading there from verse 7 and verse 8. 1 Timothy chapter 6 verse 7 but we brought nothing into this world. We brought nothing into this world. That at the time of birth, we brought nothing into this world. If you have ever seen a mother delivering a little child, when that child comes to this world, the fist is clenched. That means all the fingers are close together, holding nothing, but yet closing those fingers. And if you have ever been at the bedside of anybody who died, when they die, they open their hands empty. There's nothing they are taking away. When they come into this world, they clench those fists and close those hands with nothing in there. And when they eventually die, they open those hands to say, what am I taking away? Everything I'm leaving back. That's why it says, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. Alexander the Great was a great warrior. And he was just about three years of age when he conquered the whole world. 
And then he was dying of malaria. And then he said, when I'm dead and you bury me, you'll bury me and put my body inside, but you expose my hands, empty hands, outside, announcing to the whole world, I got the whole world, am I carrying them with me? I'm forgotten, I'm going with nothing. And that's what the Lord is saying, that all the riches and all the wealth, you cannot carry anything away, but it's so to win to the Lord. The people are waiting for you in heaven, and they're saying, you brought me here, you introduced me to heaven, you invited me to heaven, and then because of your preaching, because of your labor, and because of evangelism, they're already in heaven waiting for you, and when you get there, you have hundreds and thousands of people saying, you led me to the Lord, you made me to know about heaven, about Christ, about salvation, about holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. Welcome, welcome. The rich man will not be welcomed like that. They just die and then eternity they face, the suffering of eternity. Better be wise and know there's something that is more important than making money, than being rich, than being wealthy here on earth. It says in verse 7, it says, For brought nothing into this world. And it is certain, it is sure, that we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us be their ways content. Number 7, the priority of preaching above politics. The priority of preaching above politics. I'm looking at John chapter 6. John chapter 6. And we're looking at verses 14 and 15. John chapter 6. We're looking at verse 14. It says, then those men, when they had seen the miracle that Jesus did, they said, this is of a truth. Watch. Tell me out loud. The prophet that shall come into the world. When they saw Jesus Christ and they saw the miracle that he performed, they said, this is the prophet. That's the promise of God unto the children of Israel and unto us as well. He told Moses, a prophet like unto you. Well, I said, he will speak my word unto you. That's preaching. That's preaching. He will speak my word unto you. And everyone that will be pleasing unto me, hear him. Hear him. And when Jesus appeared at the river of baptism in Jordan, he said, this is my beloved son. Hear ye him. That is the prophet. They realize this, is, this truly is the prophet that shall come into the world. Look at the next verse, verse 15. When Jesus therefore perceived that they will come and take him by force to make him what? A king. Look at the contradiction. These people, they need to understand themselves. They said, this of a truth is a prophet. It's to tell us the mind of God. It's to preach unto us. The work is to do is to preach. But, you know, we have a kind of lousy and destroy democracy and politics. And because of that, we don't need a prophet now. We need a king. We need somebody to straighten everything out and to dispose, to depose Herod from there and to give us a good government. They wanted to make him now to become a politician. Even though they confessed that he was a prophet, to make him a king, he departed again into a mountain himself alone. He ran away from them. Why? Because he knew that the priority of his life was not politics. The priority of his life was preaching. Look at verse 38 of that same chapter. It says, for I came down from heaven not to do my own will and not to do your own will, not to be a king, not to be a politician, but to do the will of him that sent me is to preach. That's what the Lord is telling us, that we need to commit ourselves with this priority of preaching because the preaching is about popularity. The preaching is above social or society expectation. The preaching is above denominational profit or position of promotion. The preaching is above and beyond church activity. The preaching is beyond successful business. And the preaching is beyond riches and wealth. And the preaching is beyond politics. And I pray that God will help you and help me and help all of us to be wise in Jesus' name. That we don't waste our lives on the things that will perish for the world, but we'll commit ourselves to the preaching of the gospel. And then we'll be able to say what Paul the Apostle that you brethren, you know our labor and our travail for laboring night and day because we would not be chargeable unto any of you. We preached. Everybody say we preached. We preach unto you the gospel of God. We're going to preach in Jesus' name. 
bring it out as number one in your life and put every other thing in your life as number two as secondary and make preaching the priority of your existence. Let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer. That the Lord will help us that this is the real thing to do. No other thing. This is the priority. The thing to do. Call upon the name of the Lord. This is life's great commitment. In view of eternity, that you're walking and you're preaching, you're laboring, you're traveling, you're toiling, you're praying, you're serving with all your zeal, everything you've got within you because of the priority of preaching. Talk to the Lord. Evaluate what you spend your life on at present. Evaluate what you're doing at present. And the things you're putting beyond the preaching, beyond soul winning, beyond bringing souls into the kingdom. And then you seem to be satisfied with that. You're settling down into church denomination. And then the thing that ought to be number one, the focus. The priority is no more there. Talk to the Lord. Look at what the apostle did. He looked at the past. He saw the cross. Looked at the present and saw his call. Look at the future and he saw the crown. Look at the cross again. Where Christ died for you. Look at the cross again. Where Christ gave his life for you. Look at the cross again. Where he shed his blood. Look at the cross again. That he didn't reserve anything. He gave up everything. Gave up everything. And because he gave up everything, you also want to give up everything. Look at the past and see the cross. Where he died, his sorrow, his agony, his suffering. He did that for you. Somebody told you. He's done that for the rest of the people too. Get up and tell them. Rise up and tell them that Jesus died for them to take their sins away. Jesus became their substitute. Don't leave the preaching to only the general superintendent, to only the pastor, only the overseer, only the national overseer. Don't leave the crusades only to one man, only to few men. Get up and do it you. Say to us, you too, you can have crusades. Region overseers, you too, you can have crusades. Pastors, you too, you can have crusades. That's everybody's responsibility. When preaching becomes a priority, coordinator, you too can have crusades. Walkers, leaders, members of the church, you too can have crusades. Evangelize. Preach the word. Tell the sinners they don't have to die. Look at the past and see the cross. And then see what you have to do today. Look at the present and see your calling. Your calling. Your commission. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He has not commanded you to make money. He has commanded you to preach. He has not commanded you to be buried in denominational activity. He has commanded you to preach. Don't allow those good, good things you are doing in the church to block out, to blot out, to destroy the better sin, the higher sin, the greater sin, the best. Preaching the gospel to every creature. Those things you are doing, good things, but not commanded. Not commanded. In scripture, in the gospels, in the epistles, the one single thing that is commanded, you're leaving that undone. 
You allow the non-essential, you allow the unimportant to block out, to blot out the essential, the important, the priority of ministry. Evangelize the world. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Evangelize. Establish the converts. It's a curse when somebody else takes the fruit of your labor. It's a curse when you never reap the benefit of your labor. It's a blessing when you're able to reap the benefit of your labor, your labor in evangelism. When you're able to establish those souls, establish those converts, Get in those converts. Integrate those converts into the body of Christ, into the church. And enlist all members as soul winners. Enlist the members. Reach out to the members. They are born again. They are saved. They are children of God. They are members of, of the church. Call them. Disciple them. Train them. Pass the work into their hand. Encourage them. Let them have some excitement, enthusiasm in the preaching of the gospel. Take them out. Show them the example. Do it before them. Do it with them. Equip the workers to become church planters. Equip the workers to become pastors. Lead people to be committed to the work of preaching. The work of soul winning. Do it yourself. Be an example. Be in the forefront. Lay the example down. Give your time. Give your talent. Give your skill. Give your treasures. Give your resources. Give your ability. Preserve your strength for the preaching of the gospel. Don't labor on non-essentials. Don't waste your life on things that will not be remembered by heaven. Not commended, not commanded by heaven. Don't waste your life. Preach. There's joy in heaven. There's joy in heaven when you lead a sinner to repent. We're not told there's joy in heaven when you have more money. We're not told there's joy in heaven when you have promotion in your corporation. We're not told there's joy in heaven when you have all those mundane things, wealth, money, riches. When you increase your band, ex extend your band. Increase your bank account. We're not told there's joy in heaven, but there's joy in heaven. When you lead a soul to salvation, when you lead a soul to repent, when you lead a soul to take the Lord as his personal Savior and Lord, there's joy in heaven. Because joy in heaven by preaching, by evangelizing, by making evangelism so winning to be number one priority in your life. Have commitment. Yes, go to your place of work. Be faithful there. Be honest there. And your money faithfully. Feed your family. Pay your house rent. Take care of yourself. But then give quality time. To the number one thing that ought to be done. Quality time. To the priority of life. To the preaching of the gospel. Do run after money. After riches. After wealth. Wanting to be a millionaire. Leave that to the people of the world. You have something greater to do. Something more important to reach after. Something essential. 
something eternal to do. Godliness with contentment is great gain. Holiness with contentment is great gain. Righteousness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing to this world. And it is shown certain we can carry nothing out. Having therefore food and clothing, let us be therewith content. For they that will be rich by force, they drown themselves in destruction and perdition. But you, man of God, make the first things first. Make just things as number one. Make just things as priority. And put all that covetousness behind you, under your feet. And say, Lord, I will do it. Don't just be a hearer of the word. Be a doer of the word. And bring this as number one. Bring this as number one. The priority of life. Don't run after prosperity. Preaching is greater. Don't run after being popular. Popular in the church, popular in the world. Preaching is greater. Don't run after family expectation, society expectation. Preaching is a priority. Denominational profit, denominational position, denominational promotion. Climbing higher. I want to be this, I want to be that. Position in the church will not be rewarded in heaven. It's a preaching. And you can preach without position. You can evangelize without position. You don't have to be called an evangelist, a soul winner, a bishop, an archbishop. A prophet, an apostle, before you can preach, forget about the position and make preaching the priority of your life, the passion of your life, the focus of your life, the purpose of your life. Preaching above church activities. Paul rated preaching above water baptism. Above conducting marriage. Above any other activity in the church. Go out and win souls. Go out and preach the gospel. Go out and be occupied in the winning of converts, discipling of converts, until I come. Exalt preaching above your business. Exalt preaching above riches and wealth. Exalt preaching above politics. The Lord has called you a preacher. Don't degrade yourself to become a politician. Do what the Lord has called you to do. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature.